Hello. Hi there. How's it going? Good. How are you doing today? Not too bad. Uh, my name's Tom. You are? Uh, my name is Thomas Rocco. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Um, I have a quick question. Sure. Can you tell us why you are interested in carnivorous plants? Good question. Um, most plants are consumed in whole or part by animals acting as herbivores or pollinators or seed dispersers. So carnivorous plants are remarkable because they've turned the ecological tables and consume animals as prey. Uh, they uh, thus interact in unique ways with animals uh, that can serve as competitors for prey, as digestive uh, symbionts, as uh, guards for their food or butlers for their, uh, uh, for their traps, uh, and even in some cases as uh, prey mutualists uh, or as sources of uh, nutrients from uh, the droppings uh, of animals. Uh, perhaps more importantly, carnivorous plants, by absorbing mineral nutrients from animals via costly uh, traps um, that um, attract, capture, uh, and or digest prey, have gained the ability to um, live and compete successfully in some nutrient-poor environments, uh, although at the expense of uh, reduced competitive ability elsewhere. So much of my interest in carnivorous plants has been to understand uh, exactly where and under what conditions and why carnivorous plants have a competitive advantage over other plants. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, is. What is your favorite carnivorous plant? Well, probably my most uh, uh, favorite one is uh, a bromeliad, you know, relative of pineapples, called Brokinia reducta. And it's partly uh, my favorite because I discovered it. Uh, oh, not cool. the species, but the fact that it was carnivorous. Um, uh, at the time, I was uh, teaching at Harvard and uh, had a, an arrangement uh, with colleagues at the University of the Andes in Venezuela. And so uh, we decided to go down uh, to um, an elevated plateau on sandstone called the Gran Sabana. And before going, I'd read about the plants there and had uh, picked up a, a, a paper that described this unusual bromeliad with cylindrical leaves, actually not cylindrical leaves, but uh, the leaves uh, together formed a tube. And I said, well, that's really weird. What's going on there? In any case, I uh, flew down to Caracas. Um, the uh, airline lost all of my equipment, <laughs> had, had to buy uh, new sleeping bags and tents. Uh, and then we drove down uh, overnight <clears throat> and uh, arrived in the middle of the night in the Grand Savannah and camped out. And the next morning, I got out of my tent and I looked out and we're on this sort of damp, sandy, um, a savanna or open, uh, largely treeless area. And there were hundreds of these bromeliads, Burkinia reducta, um, with uh, these uh, uh, cylindrical leaf rosettes or, or circles uh, that were a bright yellow and looked for all the world uh, like uh, uh, some of the pitcher plants from uh, the southeastern uh, coastal plain. And so I, I looked at them uh, with some colleagues and said, uh, well, this is an, an interesting. So uh, first of all, they're this bright yellow green, so they really stand out uh, co yes. uh, compared with other plants in the environment. Their inner surfaces were covered with a fine waxy dust that readily uh, exfoliated. And so insects on it would slip down and into the rainwater impounded among the leaves. Um, we tore the, uh, the plants apart and found that inside they were full of the dead remains of ants. Oh. and other insects that don't ordinarily make their living in pools of water. And then subsequently found that the uh, tank fluid was highly acidic, uh, pH less than three, uh, and it emitted a sweet nectar-like odor. And finally, uh, that um, the, um, uh, there were leaf hairs on the bases of, of, of the leaves, which would absorb amino acids, um, uh, an important breakdown product of proteins at high rates. Oh, wow. And so, hey, we've discovered the first um, carnivorous plant in that family. Uh, and uh, it was occupying these open, uh, wet, but very nutrient poor environments. So that's um, uh, probably my best story uh, re regarding uh, carnivorous plants. What's the name of it again? Brokinia reducta, B-R-O-C-C-H-I-N-I-A, reducta. I'm sure you can find pictures of it on the web. 
Well, so my teacher actually has one, I guess. Oh my goodness. <laughs> does he does he end? Sorry? Does he have it there or is it at home? No, it's at home. It's at home. It's at home. Okay. Well, uh, I should say that um, another interesting thing about Burkina is that um, you really need very sunny conditions <clears throat> for it to assume that cylindrical shape. Uh, so the leaves be are more spreading in um, um, sh shadier uh, microsites. Uh, so uh, the, the illumination has to be quite strong for the leaves to go vertical. But that would make sense. A lot of plants do that to either reduce um, evaporation or to uh, reduce uh, damage to their photosynthetic apparatus by overly intense sunlight. And many plants also produce um, uh, carotenoids, you know, yellow pigments, to uh, protect their um, photosynthetic mechanism from damage. So it's entirely conceivable that the first few steps toward carnivory were just adaptations to very bright conditions under nutrient poor, um, uh, nutrient -poor soils. <clears throat> Pardon me. That is, that is pretty cool. So I have another cool. quick question. In sure. 1984, you created the new definition for carnivorous plants and scientists still use it today. How did you come across, or how did you create that definition? Well, I had long been interested in carnivorous plants and uh, yet um, I, I also uh, knew a lot about the ecology uh, of other plants. And in order to uh, differentiate clearly carnivorous plants, uh, from the others, um, and that had never been done, even by Darwin, who sort of first started the serious study of carnivorous plants. I proposed that a plant had to fulfill two requirements uh, to uh, be considered carnivorous. So first, I uh, had to be able to absorb mineral nutrients like nitrogen or phosphorus from dead animals uh, next to its surfaces, and in that way obtain some increment to reproductive success uh, or fitness in terms of increased growth, uh, chance of survival, flowering, or seed set. And secondly, uh, a plant had to have some unequivocal adaptation or resource allocation whose primary result uh, was the uh, active attraction, capture, and or digestion uh, of prey. Uh, now the first requirement is needed uh, to uh, differentiate uh, carnivory from purely defensive adaptations that immobilize or kill potential animal enemies without leading to substantial nutrient absorption and resulting increases in plant survival and reproduction. And the second requirement is needed uh, because many plants uh, can passively profit by absorbing some nutrients from dead animals, for example, nematodes or earthworms that are decomposing in the soil or on leaf surfaces. And a survey uh, that I made at the time of the recognized uh, genera of carnivorous plants showed that uh, adaptations uh, for all three processes of active prey attraction, capture and digestion are not required or were had not been required to qualify plant as carnivorous on either logical or historical grounds. So for example, bladderworts um, with their little traps below the waterline and butterworts with sticky uh, leaves appear to lack uh, any means of attracting prey. Um, and also some pitcher plants lack digestive glands and appear to depend on insect larvae and bacteria uh, to break down their prey. Now, all carnivorous plants do have adaptations to capture prey, although only some involve active movements like um, Venus flytrap or uh, some sundews that move at a somewhat slower rate. Um, and um, uh, only some how, uh, of the carnivorous plants, however, have digestive uh, enzymes or uh, produce unequivocal attractants. That is pretty cool. So why should people today be still celebrating World Carnivorous Plant Day? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, carnivorous plants uh, should, I think, uh, be celebrated for showing some of the most remarkable adaptations that natural selection can create. Uh, many carnivorous plants, uh, we believe today, on, on firmer ground than Darwin did when he published his book on insectivorous plants in 1875, evolved from ancestors with sticky glandular hairs that protected them against caterpillars or bugs or other insects that might otherwise eat their leaves or suck their sap, uh, evolving the ability to absorb mineral nutrients from captured herbivores like that 
uh, would have provided carnivorous plants with an additional ecological advantage in habitats in which nutrients limit plant growth and then led to the evolution of other uh, even more extraordinary uh, adaptations for prey attraction, capture and digestion, and occasionally uh, uh, to the, the recruitment of other animals, non-prey animals, uh, as external digestive glands, as guards for their prey, uh, or as uh, butlers who keep their traps clean and functioning. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Sure, how absolutely. Many, how many carnivorous plants have you, have you discovered any new plants or have you like made names for them or? Well, that's a good question. So um, I've currently uh, discovered uh, uh, two um, subspecies. That is to say, I didn't discover the species. Yeah. I demonstrated they were carnivorous. So both of those are in uh, the genus Brokinia. Uh, I've helped refine arguments for uh, why a few other plants are carnivorous. And uh, uh, my colleagues and I have a, a paper that's um, in review at a journal right now uh, involving um, the discovery of carnivory in, in, in another species, uh, in a totally different group of, uh, of monocots. So bromeliads are monocots. Uh, the uh, uh, new species, which I can't really tell you what it is because we haven't yeah. published it yet, uh, is another monocot. Um, sorry. It's okay. Thank you for joining us. And My pleasure. I hope you have a fantastic day, and thank you for joining us for World Carnivorous Plant Day. Nice to meet you, Thomas, and I hope you get to study a lot of carnivorous plants. Thank you.